Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm going to share an amazing Roman monument with you today. Just a quick reminder before the episodes get started, all sources and images referenced will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find that link in the episode description, as well as on Instagram at accessible.art.history. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. The Pantheon is one of the oldest surviving monuments from ancient Rome. To this day, it still stands proud in the center of a bustling city. Its name means, quote, to all the gods, and it is certainly a structure fit for the divine. The Pantheon has a unique layout that almost seems to defy logic. Overall, it's a fascinating place, and I can't wait to share it with you. So to learn more, keep on listening. And a special thank you to listener Laura for sponsoring today's episode. On the front of the Pantheon, there's an inscription that reads, Marcus Agrippa, son of Lucius, made this building when council for the third time. But who was Marcus Agrippa, and how did he have the means to build such a magnificent structure? His full name was Marcus Vipsanus Agrippa, and he was born around 63 BCE. His family were plebeians, or the common class, but Agrippa had the skills to rise through the military ranks. As a young man, he became acquainted with Octavian. When Julius Caesar was assassinated, the two returned to Rome from their campaigns. Octavian took his place as Caesar's heir, and helped his friend to achieve his own measure of power. And if you want to learn more about Octavian Augustus, make sure to tune into the first episodes of the season. In 40 BCE, Agrippa became the Praetor Urbis or Urban Prefect of Rome, meaning that he was in charge of the administration of the city. About a year later, he was made the governor of Gaul. Agrippa's biggest achievement came with the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. He commanded Octavian's fleet and led it to victory over the forces of Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. This allowed Octavian to become the first emperor of Rome and take the name Augustus. For his service and friendship, Agrippa was given a lot of power in the new empire, but he never forgot where he came from. He helped pay for renovations to aqueducts, ensuring that all citizens had access to free, clean drinking water. He also helped pass laws that didn't exclude the lower classes. Augustus granted him veto power in the Senate, helping him in the task of ruling. He was also granted land in the city on which the Pantheon was built. According to records, it was part of a trio of buildings that included a basilica and a bath. It's likely that these were for his own private use. However, we aren't sure what the original structure of the Pantheon would have looked like, because archaeological digs have revealed that the majority of the Agrippan Pantheon was destroyed in a fire. Some archaeologists believe it would have looked like a standard Greek temple with a rectangular plan. The two men came even closer when Agrippa married Augustus' daughter, Julia the Elder. This made him the maternal grandfather of Caligula, and the maternal great-grandfather of Nero, another podcast subject. When Agrippa died around 12 BCE in his 50s, Augustus was devastated. In fact, he ordered that Agrippa's remains be placed in his own family's mausoleum. The pantheon we know and love today was actually built or rebuilt under the direction of Hadrian around 118 to 128 CE, despite what the inscription tells us. In fact, it wasn't until the late 19th century that archaeologists even discovered that someone other than Agrippa had built the space. This was actually a common occurrence for Hadrian's building programs because he only took credit for one of his builds, the Temple of the Deified Trajan. His goal wasn't necessary to glorify himself or his reign, but to build up Rome's glory through its structures. While creating a new plan for the building, Hadrian decided to shake things up a bit. He was a lover of all things Greek, so it was only natural that the front of the Pantheon resembled the finest temples in Athens. However, instead of extending the rectangle backwards, Hadrian decided to create a space with a large dome or top. I'll discuss the details of this later in the episode, but the dome is one of many things that make this pantheon so remarkable. At the top of the episode, I mentioned that the pantheon is one of the best surviving structures from the ancient Roman period. Despite its architectural achievements, there's another answer for this miracle. In 609 CE, about 600 years after it was built, the Byzantine emperor Phocas gave the building to Pope Boniface IV. He decided to turn it from a pagan temple to all the gods, into a Christian church consecrated to the Virgin Mary and all the martyrs. According to contemporary records, 28 cartloads of holy relics of martyrs were removed from the catacombs of Rome and placed in a basin beneath the high altar. In general, this transformation saved the pantheon from being demolished. However, there were some instances of the building being stripped from materials. For example, in 663 CE, Emperor Constans II decided to help himself. According to Paul the Deacon, a Benedictine monk and historian of the time, Quote, remaining at Rome 12 days, he pulled down everything that in ancient times had been made of metal for the ornament of the city, 
to such an extent that he even stripped off the roof of the Church of the Blessed Mary, which at one time was called the Pantheon, and had been founded in the honor of all the gods, and was now by the consent of the former rulers the place of all the martyrs, and he took away from there the bronze tiles and sent them with all other ornaments to Constantinople. During the medieval and renaissance period, much of the exterior marble was removed for other building processes. In the early 17th century, Pope Urban VIII removed the bronze ceiling of the portico and added two towers to replace the medieval era bell tower or campanile. The bronze was actually used to make the famous Baldacchino design by Fernini and that stands in the center of St. Peter's Basilica today. In an unsurprising twist, some of the capitals from the pilasters on the exterior of the Pantheon ended up in the British Museum. Despite this pillaging, the Pantheon's interior has remained relatively intact. Thank goodness, because it is a truly beautiful space filled with multicolored marble and a coffered ceiling. Next, I'm going to discuss the specifics of the architecture of the Pantheon. But first, let's take a quick break. Hey everyone! I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about what software I use to bring Accessible Art History, the podcast, to life. It's called Anchor, and it's truly made a difference in my mission of making art history fun and easy to learn about. Although I'd always thought about adding a podcast to my content creation, the thought scared me. I'm not an audio engineer or a tech guru, but Anchor makes it so easy. You can use their website or app to record, edit, and spice up your audio with music. They partner with you to make your podcast a success. Not only do they take care of distributing it to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, but they even match you up with sponsors with no minimum listenership required. It makes creating a podcast easier than I honestly thought possible. But the best part? It's absolutely free to use. As someone who is in the beginning stages of content creation, I'm so thankful to have a free platform that helps me create a quality podcast. If you want to get started on your own podcast, simply go to anchor.fm that's A-N-C-H-O-R-F-M, or download their app on your preferred app store. Thanks so much for listening. Hi there, my name is Annalisa, and I'm the founder of Accessible Art History. My goal is to bring art history content to anyone that is curious. All my platforms can be accessed for free, but there are ways that you can support the cause. If you enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review on your favorite platform. I also have a Patreon and a Buy Me A Coffee account set up if you feel inclined to support accessible art history monetarily. However, I will always work to bring content for free because I believe that education should be accessible for those who want and need it. Thank you for listening, and now let's get back to the episode. All right, now that we're back, let's dive into the architecture. When first approaching the Pantheon, visitors are greeted by a massive portico, or porch. The building used to have stairs, but centuries of building and human expansion and occupation have raised the ground level enough so that they're no longer necessary and were removed. Once inside the porch, the space is dominated with over a dozen massive Corinthian columns. Through podcasts, it's kind of hard to illustrate just how big they are in person. In fact, it takes multiple people wrapping their arms around them in a bear hug to completely encircle each column. Atop the columns sit a pediment or triangular roof-like structure. The bottom part of this triangle is called the frieze. This is where the aforementioned description about Agrippa is located. The rest of the pediment is fairly plain, but likely would have had some kind of decoration over the centuries. Evidence in this form of small peg holes indicate that at one point, an eagle holding a wreath would have been on the pediment. The wreath would have had long bronze ribbons extending outwards towards the corners of the structures. Eagles were common symbols of strength in the military in Roman times, especially fitting due to the structure's original builder, Agrippa. To enter the Pantheon, people must pass through a giant set of bronze doors. They measure at an astounding 14.6 or 4.45 meters wide, 24.7 feet high or 7.53 meters. For decades, archaeologists believed that the doors were 15th century replicas. However, further analysis indicated that they were in fact the Roman originals. This is absolutely remarkable, especially since the other bronze pieces were taken down and melted for other uses. It is theorized it survived because Christian motifs were added when the Pantheon was consecrated as a church. The dome is arguably the Pantheon's most famous feature. Even today, it's considered an architectural marvel. Measuring at nearly 5,000 tons, it is supported by eight barrel vaults that direct the force downwards and into the ground. To prevent unnecessary weight from being created, the Roman architects decided to use a variety of materials depending on the location. 
At its thickest point, the dome is made of travertine. Then, as we move up, it's terracotta tiles. And then at the very top, tufa and pumice. These volcanic rocks are very light, yet strong, and would have put the least amount of stress on the dome. At the very top, the dome would have been at its weakest. So, in a genius move, the architects cut out an oculus into the rock. Not only would this alleviate the pressure, but it fills the space with much needed light. Additionally, coffers or small indentations are cut into the rock. Originally, they would have been filled with decoration, likely made of bronze, but those were stripped away long ago. If you extend the dome down and around, it would create a sphere with 142 feet or 43 meters in diameter. That's the exact height from the floor to the oculus. Today, still the Pantheon's dome is the world's largest unreinforced concrete dome. This architectural wonder truly puts this structure on the map. Although it's easy to get distracted by the magnificent dome and oculus, the interior of the Pantheon is also a sight to behold. Visitors might notice that there's a slight incline to the floor. This is because the Romans thought ahead. With a giant hole in the ceiling, there had to be a way to drain the rainwater. So the incline leads to a small drain in the floor that would allow the water to flow out into the bottom. Like the exterior, the interior is based on circles and squares. Looking down, the floor is designed to include both shapes and different colors of marble. Corinthian columns and small pediments decorate the walls, bringing a sense of cohesion to the space. Throughout the day, the oculus acts like a reverse sundial, telling the time with light instead of shadow. It truly is a marvelous place. As a church and symbol of the city, it is no surprise that there are important people buried within the Pantheon. One of the most famous, especially for us art history lovers, is the High Renaissance Master Raphael. He was incredibly popular with the people of Rome, and when he died unexpectedly at the age of 37, the city plunged into mourning. His funeral was extremely lavish, with his coffin being carried by four cardinals and blessed by the Pope himself. He and his fiance, who passed before him, are buried together. Their tomb reads, here lies Raphael, by whom the great mother of all things, nature, feared to be overcome while he was living, and while he was dying, herself to die. Additionally, the Pantheon was intended to be the final resting place of the monarchs of the unified Italian nation. Two of her kings, Vittorio Manuele II, the first king of Italy, and Umberto I, as well as Umberto's queen, Queen Margarita, were laid to rest there. However, when the monarchy was abolished in 1946, the new government did not allow the other two kings, who died in exile, Vittorio Manuel III and Umberto II, to be buried there. For the last few millennia, the Pantheon has been a focal point for the city of Rome. Due to its fame, its influence has stretched across the globe. For example, Thomas Jefferson's library at the University of Virginia was based on its design. Its simplistic yet complicated design has earned it the nickname, the Eighth Wonder of the World. Make sure to tune in next week for the season 13 finale when I discuss Hadrian's Villa. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history for updates and keep an eye out on the next episode. They drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, you can find episodes on there about two weeks after the episodes are posted. Cheers and see you next week.